principles aren't principles until they cost you something. Let's be really honest and talk about how you viewed feminism. The feminism I was coming across was whether or not air conditioning was sexist, you know? And I'd felt it was very trivial. Hello, I'm Julie Bindle, and this is Action Men, a series in which I have interesting conversations with men that actually get up off their backsides and contribute to the work that feminists are doing to prevent rape, domestic violence, and challenge pornography and the sex trade. This week, I'm speaking with Michael Foran, who's a lecturer in public law at the University of Glasgow. For the former Scottish First Minister, Nicola Sturgeon, her downfall came after trying to push forward the Gender Recognition Act, a dangerous bill allowing self-identifying females, actually males, to enter women-only spaces. Michael was behind the movement, laying out the legal framework that was able to bring down Sturgeon's campaign. Tell me a little bit about yourself. Right, well, I'm a legal scholar, I think is the best way to describe it. I'm an academic who works in a university, who teaches and researches on um, equality law is my main area of um, interest and expertise. Um, and I suppose the thing that I'm most known for now is that I've done a lot of uh, public commentary on the law in relation to sex and gender. And I came across your work before I met you, so I read that you were this man who was in academia and had dipped his toe, in fact, thrown himself in full force, I think, to the cesspit that is the issue about women's sex-based rights and the threat from the gender ideology of current. So tell me what you think that you have done that might actually help us in our ongoing struggle to maintain those rights. Yeah, I think the, the this is kind of an interesting story because I... I didn't come into this wanting to do something that would be kind of classed as activism necessarily. Um, I initially wrote a short blog post in a specialist constitutional law blog about the definition of sex in the Equality Act and how that feeds into what at that point was an ongoing um, trajectory of um, legislation through the Scottish Parliament, the Gender Recognition Reform bill which would have introduced self-id as a as a legal policy into scotland and i, I just kind of posited a, a blog post that, that said that there was a, a legal mechanism here that the uk government could have relied on if it wanted to to block this bill um, and the reason why it could have blocked that bill was because the bill was going to have adverse impacts on the operation of equality law specifically as that relates to uh, women and girls um, and also and um, particularly communities like Muslim women or, or Orthodox Jewish women. Um, and so I, I, I posited that and the blog post happened to be published on the second day of the reading of the bill in the Scottish Parliament. And so then within a few hours, this had been picked up and it was um, cited on the floor of the Scottish Parliament by Pauline McNeill. And at that point, things went into a direction I didn't think they were they were going to go into. Things really, <laughs> they, they took off. And I decided I was going to double down. So I had a very busy Christmas. My family were checking in on handing me plates of dinner while I was writing this big, long um, piece. And the, the basically the, the, the paper was uh, the argument in favour of blocking this bill. The reason why the bill and the policies related to it would cause conflicts of rights that could have a much wider impact outside of Scotland as well and would have touched upon reserved areas that the, the UK government and um, Parliament as a whole might want to be consulted on. So these conflicts of rights, obviously, they're between women and those men that identify as trans women. Yeah, so legally this is a, this is a really difficult framework. And one of the things that we have uh, a, a difficulty and a confusion in at the moment is just how in law are we defining the category of woman? Um, what, what does sex mean in law? That's become really, really complicated and really, really contested lately. Um, but one thing that was clear in the law up until this bill was coming in was that it was not on the basis of self-ID. Um, you couldn't just declare yourself to be a member of the opposite sex and then legally be treated as a member of the opposite sex. What you did have in law were protections for people on the basis of what's referred to as gender reassignment, which basically means if you're proposing to undergo, you are undergoing, or you have undergone 
a process or part of a process of changing aspects of your sex. So physiological aspects of your sex or other kinds of aspects of your sex, you're protected in discrimination law. So you can't be fired for this. So if um, someone was going through a process of medical transition or something like that, and they told their employer they were doing that, they, they couldn't be fired for that. Which, of course, feminists have always supported. We yeah. shouldn't discriminate against people because of the way they live their lives in the sense that they live as the opposite sex. It started to get very difficult, didn't it, when trans activists started to say, we are women, we are female, we will enter the spaces, and we don't agree with exemptions. We've seen many an example of how the female bathrooms in public buildings have been made into the non-binary, the either sex, either whichever gender, and the men's have remained the men's. And that's outrageous discrimination, isn't it? Yeah, this would be what would we would normally call this indirect discrimination. So this is what looks like a neutral rule. They've converted some of the toilets into um, into gender neutral toilets, but it actually has a disproportionately negative effect on. Um, one group over another. And actually, in this context, um, if you had kept the men's toilets the same and had converted the women's toilets only, and the reasons that you can imagine someone would be thinking about with this would be, well, we want cubicles, we don't want to have to deal with urinals, so it's easier if we just convert the the spaces that have already just got cubicles. And um, that's sailing to account for the fact that what you've done there is you've treated women less favorably than you've treated men because you've removed... Um, something from them and you've not removed it from men. So it could be direct discrimination in that context. But if, let's say, you, you all you did instead was to just make all of your toilets gender neutral. Um, and what I mean by gender neutral toilets there is is not creating a separate space that we class as a gender neutral toilet that people can use, but converting existing spaces into mixed sex spaces. That's not going to have as much of a negative impact upon men. It's a neutral rule. You've converted all of your toilets to, to gender neutral toilets. But the people who are disproportionately affected by that are going to be women, they're going to be Muslim women, they're going to be Orthodox Jewish women. They might also be Muslim and Orthodox Jewish men as well. Um, but on the whole, the people who um, suffer from that are going to be women. And that's what's going to give rise to the kinds of indirect discrimination concerns that we'd be interested in as, as, as equality lawyers. So th the point about thinking about these kinds of questions from the perspective of equality law is to bear in mind that equality law is an ecosystem. You have to be concerned about how your policies affect all affected groups. Um, and that does include being concerned about how that's going to affect people who are covered under gender reassignment as well. But it means you can't take a myopic focus on on all of them. Um, and so for that reason, the you know, I'm interested in this because some of these policies are disproportionately affecting women. But I don't think I'd see myself coming at this solely from the perspective of women's rights concern. But let's look at your um, focus on the disproportionate effect on women. Many of us met you after your baptism of fire, your your blog, and I met you in person a while ago. You've obviously been supportive of organisations such as LGB Alliance, particularly with the vexatious case taken against them by mermaids. You've been around and about some of the circles I move in and it was a real pleasure to meet you knowing that a man in academia, what age are you? 29. So a man of your age, of your generation, in academia currently, would normally be on the trans women and women, sex work is work, neoliberal side of the fence. And I'm not suggesting that we would agree on everything in, in all of my feminist beliefs and principles and the like. But you have a very clear-cut notion, I would say, that women as a sex class are oppressed by men as a sex class. But has this brought you into new territories? I mean, talking to the likes of me and getting involved in what is a very, very painful and bitter time for feminists and has been for some years because of the gender ideology and capture of institutions and the like. Yeah, I, I think this has been a real learning experience for me in a number of ways that you'd only really experience, you, particularly as a man, I think you'd only really know if you've, if you've, if you've gone through the experience of it. Um, 
I didn't know how much I didn't know about this topic until I wrote something about it, not really thinking about it from the perspective of, like, I've been following these debates, but I'd not been thinking it from within the perspective of the groups that might be uh, affected by it. Um, and, and one thing I, I, I did notice the more that I got into it was how little I knew about this topic, even as a lawyer. Like, I, th there are a lot of expert lawyers who will know the law about a particular area, but won't know it in the level of depth because we're kind of generalists, particularly if you're a generalist equality lawyer, you're not going to be that focused on it. And so some of the stuff that I would have come across was seeing, in particular, women who have been writing about this topic for years, years and years and years, who know more about this topic than most other people, just being dismissed um, and th their views not taken seriously. Um, and you, we, you know, we saw this in, in, in policy arguments and we saw this, you know, the, the classic example now that's becoming infamous is Nicola Sturgeon saying that these concerns are not valid and um, we've now had politicians say that you know it's all just a bunch of 50 year old Karens which is both misogynistic and ageist but what you've also seen what I've also seen as well is that the backlash although I did get significant backlash and continue to get um, you know this is a very heated very toxic debate I think and there are people on all sides of the the the, the arguments that have uh, kind of fueled those those flames in particular ways but one thing I've absolutely noticed is that had I been a woman, this would have been a lot worse. The The kinds of experiences that I have had in terms of kind of pushback and critique and things like that, um, I've not got sexualized threats. Nobody has threatened to rape me. Nobody has threatened to um, to assault me. Nobody has spoken down to me in a way. You know, I've, I've benefited both from being an academic and from being a male academic, I think. And seeing in particular... Um, discrimination lawyers, you know, who will, I, I will say, for example, I, I think I tweeted saying something along the lines of, I think this would have been a lot different had I been a woman. And then a, discri a female discrimination lawyer that, that I know who's, who's been writing about this for years, Audrey Ludwig, who's brilliant, um, quote tweeted that and said, yes, that's probably true. And then she got a whole host of misogynistic abuse as a result of it. It was just proved its point in a way that I did not experience. Um, so it's been a real learning experience for me. Um, and I think this is the kind of stuff that you, you know, you're constantly changing your views on uh, on this. And I know, you know, when I was when I was a lot younger, 10 years or so, I would have been approaching questions around feminism from a very skeptical perspective. And I think I've really moved on a lot since then. Uh, Tell me a little bit about that, if you would, Michael. The 18, 19-year-old, 20-year-old self and what feminism meant to you then. So we're talking about, what, 2013, 14, that, yeah, that yeah. era. And obviously the gender ideology was already alive and well, but about to reach a new peak. What would you have said about feminists like me? Let's be really honest. Um and and talk about how you viewed feminism at that time and how it shifted and how you view it now. Well, I think part of the reason why I had the views that I, I had back then, which would have been skeptical of some of the kind of philosophical claims that are made from within feminism, like the idea of patriarchy, would have been predominantly because I had not been introduced to the kinds of what I would see as a very distinctly British feminist approach. Um, my critique at that time, the things that I was concerned about was how um, feminism, as I understood it, which I think was a predominantly American type of feminism, wasn't particularly concerned about class. Um, and in particular, the kinds of um, experiences that working class men would have um, dealt with. So I've come from a working class background. Um, so I would have grown up and I would have seen um, people who I would have known as like uncles and you know my father spent 10 years of his life mixing concrete blocks with his hands it was a really tough job to do and you're hearing stories about how um, the exclusion of women from the workplace in the you know throughout the, the, the scope of history um, served to prevent women from being economically capable of looking after themselves and that was obviously true but I, I thought it failed. It, it very much came from the perspective of a woman who wanted to be a barrister like her husband and not a woman who wanted to spend 16 hours a day in a coal mine like her husband. So I had I had a very critical perspective on that. I thought that was really failing to encounter that kind of stuff. And in particular, I thought, you know, the kind of feminism that you do, looking at the most disadvantaged people in society, women who've been 
raped or trafficked or who've been subject to the most obscene forms of violence. The feminism that I was coming across was not that kind of feminism. The feminism I was coming across was whether or not air conditioning was sexist, you know? And and I felt it was very trivial, really. Um, but I, I'm not going to disagree with you. I mean, American feminism has been a blight on the grassroots feminist movement across Europe. And the way I would describe it, and I know many American feminists or feminists based in North America that do not fit this bill at all, but they talk about the glass ceiling. They don't talk about the basement. They don't talk about the women in the basement as the ones that need the most liberating. And I don't mean that we go in to save them, but I mean liberation from the constraints of their lives. I mean, they don't have an opportunity to leave a violent relationship. They don't have an opportunity to go for an abortion or to even complain about rape because they're going to be seen as worthless, as rapeable, as irrelevant and unimportant. And we see that with murder victims, serial killer murder victims, where these women are just seen as disposable. And then on the other hand, you've got some elite American feminists, some of them within academia and some of them just within very wealthy human rights or NGO organizations where they literally are concerned about somebody earning three quarters of a million dollars as opposed to a million dollars, which her male counterpart is. Now, we know that's sexism. We know that's discrimination. But why would we care about fighting for the rights of those women when they're never going to look at the material reality of the lives of women that can't even get a day off to give birth, let alone maternity benefits or rooms in which they can express milk so that they don't have to have the inconvenience of bringing in their nanny to work. I mean, all of those issues, they're all specific to women, they're all specific to sexism, but where's the prioritising? Yeah, and I mean, I think you see this, this also kind of parses itself out in some of the debates that we're seeing now, because I can guarantee that the the people, the, the, the feminists, the activists who were thinking about something like self-ID hadn't even contemplated women in prison. Absolutely. That wasn't something that came across their their desks. It's they were... an elitist, it's a very, very elitist idea for them because they won't know anyone in prison and they'll imagine that they'll never be in prison and they'll imagine that they would never need to use the services of a refuge because they'll have the resources to escape a violent household through other means. So yes, you're right. Yeah. And and, and I think, I mean, part of this is also, I've had a, a shift in my own thinking about like what the purpose of politics is and, and things like that. It made me reassess, you know, the, 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 the feminist sex wars in the 80s, these fights between liberal feminists and radical feminists about whether or not to support pornography, whether or not to support prostitution, whether or not to call prostitution sex work and, 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 and things like that. And it seems to me that on the one hand, you have uh, a liberal feminist perspective that says the purpose of feminism is to give women more choices, regardless of whether they're coerced into those choices, regardless of whether the those choices are, are good for them. Um, and then the radical feminist critique that says the purpose of feminism is to make women's lives better. And that requires us to think much more substantively about what a good life and what, crucially, a very bad life might look like. Yes, and also the normative effect and how that ripples through societies and affects the most disenfranchised women on the planet. And if we look at the women in prostitution, for example, if we if we look at indigenous women across Canada, if we look at Maori women in Australia, if we look at um, black women in the US, women in poverty and f who've come out of care in the UK, all of those examples are all of women with the least choice in their lives, ending up in prostitution, what a surprise. And then of course you've got the very women that have the most choice in life, and many of these women are in academia, saying that sex work is work, and how dare you remove the choice from women to do that. And the men are invisible in this. So the punters, the sex buyers, the johns, whatever you want to call them, they're laughing. They're the invisible man. Because of course, the prostituted woman, or the proud sex worker, whichever way you look at it, is held up as a smokescreen for him. He, he, he's just not in the picture. 
And we tend not to talk about the men who have the most choice doing that to women who have the least choice. I mean, has your has your view shifted on that over the years? Yeah, no, I think it has. I and mean, I think one of one of the things that shifted as well is I think I've moved away from what you'd see as a liberal or a neoliberal perspective on this, which seems to operate from the kind of perspective that we are all wholly self-contained, autonomous, whole individuals that are not really influenced by the society around us and make our all of our choices entirely free from it, the influences of culture and um, into understanding that we are not apolitical, we are not asocial. There's no such thing as the, as the human that exists free from the society that they're in. And if you think about it from that perspective and then you think about something like prostitution, pornography, these kind of things, it, it's... You can have a normative argument about whether they're good or not, but you can't deny that they're going to have an effect on the norms that exist within society. And we, we see this in the context of teenage girls now who think that being choked during sex is something that is expected of them, is something that is desirable for them, and it's resulting in them being abused and in some cases even being killed. Um, and they're getting that, they're not getting that from, you know, reading feminist pamphlets about how sex work is empowering they're not getting that from um thinking to themselves in an ivory tower what would be the best kind of sexual gratification i could ever get they're absorbing it from the culture around them and so the importance of culture is something that i've shifted on as well and the idea that we're we really are embedded in an existing normative world and you can't escape that so you have to deal with it and i think that's the same thing is true for contexts like um Muslim women or or as um, Orthodox Jewish women, um, you know, in an ideal world, you might think we don't want to have um, women wear headscarves. We don't want to have women in contexts where they're being separated. But in the world that we're in, we have to deal with the fact that these women do exist and that they do believe these things and they find deep spiritual satisfaction from those and they're not going to alter their behavior in the way that people expect like the example of banning headscarves anybody who thinks banning headscarves in public means that muslim women who wear headscarves are going to take their headscarves off when they go around in public is just fooling themselves and it ignores the fact that those women are not choosing to wear a headscarf from an absolute open vacuum of free choice there is a stigma upon those women that don't wear headscarves. I know that there are women who think of it as a to the West and I'm going to put on a headscarf and I'm going to make a point and I'm going to look visibly Muslim. I know that those women exist. But largely, women who are veiled do so because that is required of them. And we know about modesty and we know about the requirements for women to be modest within religious cultures and outside of it. But I've always thought and often said that if men en masse, and in particular the kind of young middle class entitled men, like a p particular form of feminism as is being presented, such as slut walk and sex work is work and trans women are women, then there must be something wrong with it. Because a feminism that challenges men and that men understand, men that are serious about being on the side of women fighting to end all these horrors. Men understand that you lose some of your privilege and your power and your control. We absolutely do. And as, a, as a white person in South Africa, I was very aware that if I wanted to challenge myself and behave properly during that trip, that it was going to be a little bit more difficult for me than it would have been had I just gone along with the culture that lauded me as something special in that country. And I think for men to say, Men like Owen Jones, Billy Bragg, to say most feminists disagree with you. What they mean is that most women that have absorbed these anti-feminist tropes disagree with us. It's not, and I'd love to know what you think of this, it's not enough to simply adopt the label of feminist. You have to actually do feminism and believe in a particular, stand by a particular set of aims and objectives. I don't mean rules, and I don't mean membership cards, but there has to be a basis to every single political movement, doesn't there? Yeah, I mean, two things I might say from that. One of them is that your principles aren't principles until they cost you something. Um, that there's nothing that, 
you know, if your principles happen to always work out in your favor every single time, then they're not principles. You're just finding ways to rationalize what's in your self-interest. Um, so the, the, the real test for whether or not you're true to your principles is exactly the point at which it becomes something that you have to sacrifice something for. That's the point at which they move away from being simply the way you operate in the world into being genuine constraints on your conduct. Um, but secondly, I think, I mean, you know, the, the example here of, um, you know, the majority of women um, or the majority of the people who uh, are thinking about these kinds of questions from a, a, a pro-trans rights perspective. And again, this is this is the thing that I think language is really important here because that operates from the presumption that um, people who are concerned about the tensions between those rights don't want trans people to have rights at all. Um, but let's say you see you know, people who people who support something like self ID as a policy. One story you can tell about that is to say, um, yes, the majority of the people who support that policy are women. But the majority of the people who oppose that policy are also women. The, the, the real story here is the conspicuous absence of men in this conversation at all. Um, and part of that is, I think, um, because at that point, you know, men are just not generally don't tend to be very interested in things that predominantly affect women, um, one way or the other. And part of it, I think, is that, you know, Again, part of that kind of story that was um, told about the kind of different waves or trajectories of kind of feminist advocacy. There was a very long time when men were effectively told, if you're not a part of this conversation, then don't talk about it. And I think some of them said, great, I don't have to talk about it <laughs> and I won't. Yeah, I think that was a bit of an own goal. The, um, okay, so you can't say things, get them wrong, be kicked up the arse and get back on with it. You just have to be silent. And it it's reminiscent of, I mean, I suppose the, the kind of new wave of that uh, philosophy is shut up, sit down, read a book, which is awful. Yeah. And everybody gets things wrong or really learns that maybe that wasn't right, how I thought about that, but I now think more clearly about it and have conversations with people that's a much more civilized way to get through the the nightmare that is any political perspective or philosophy isn't it yeah i mean i think there's a there's a real dearth of forgiveness in politics um and you know the idea that you can look at someone and somebody says i've thought about this and i was wrong um that that's it's almost impossible to hear someone say that now because it's not going to do them any good in in, in many contexts. They've well, already they been judged. It. Yeah, yeah, or they say it, such as the recent example of the theatre director in Scotland who was told off for liking a couple of tweets. One of which, by coincidence, was mine. Very kind of oh, terrible. Should never have done that. Yeah, yeah. very, very <laughs> you know ordinary call out for. Can you give me some information about an article I'm writing? Everybody on Twitter. And he just rolled over and abjectly apologized, capitulated, and it was and humiliated himself. That that wasn't an apology. He didn't need to give an apology. It it was it was a kind of please, please, please forgive me because I know that otherwise the bullies will come after me forever. And he's not going to he's just going to shut down now. Yeah. I mean very often what happens there is and this is one of those things where the online world is very different from the the in-person world. Like in person, if someone had said that, there's a very real chance that even people who really, really don't like that person will respond and say, okay, well, we'll, we'll deal with you as a person. But but online, the, the, the framework gets very different. And so the second you start doing something like that, the, the consequence is that things double down. And I think you saw this, I mean, there's slight parallels to be had between what happened to Kathleen Stock and, and an experience that I had. So, you know, Kathleen Stock is effectively hounded out of her university. And part of that is because at the start of all of this, her university and even her trade union made uh, noises to the effect of she kind of deserves this, um, apologising for defending her. I mean, her trade union said that she had weaponized her employment rights, which, I'm sorry, if you're a trade union and you're concerned about people weaponizing employment rights, you're in the wrong business. Um, but leaving that aside... The consequence of that was that it got worse and it got progressively worse for Kathleen. It got to the point where 
she had to have police protection. She was not safe on campus. She now basically has police protection pretty much everywhere she goes. And part of that was because people initially capitulated. Now, I don't think I'm anywhere near in the same league as the the, the kind of influence that Kathleen Stock has had or the kind of no- notoriety that she's gotten. But after writing about the legal questions that we and a lot of the stuff I've been writing is just attempts to clarify the law. There's a lot of misinformation floating around about what legal rights people have in this sphere. Um, there was an attempt by some people to kind of drum up a campaign to get me fired from my university. Um, and and I think people had really learned from the Kathleen Stock incidents because not only did my university very quickly reassure me that I was not in any danger, there was also very, very public support from senior colleagues and from um, professors and uh, and other academics at other institutions coming out very, very vocally and I think some of that was just a genuine commitment from people who are working in my field to um, defend academic freedom. But I think some of it will be people who might have felt guilty about not doing the same thing when it happened to Kathleen Stark and felt actually, you know, we've we've learned some lessons from that. Um, and the result of that was that it just stopped. It went away. I mean, the second, if, the, if this kind of campaign starts and then people start capitulating and saying, well, maybe we'll start investigating this person. Maybe we'll look into whether or not the person has actually engaged in, um, you know, the claims that were being made was that I was unsafe to be around students because I was oh, accurately, yeah. Oh, please. Um, and so, yeah, this was, but, but, but the consequence of this was that it was quickly shot down and then it stopped. It didn't happen again. Um, and I think that's the consequence of, you know, people in institutions who have the capacity it doesn't cost them very much to be brave on this, to to stand up and say, you know, I had a, I had a very senior colleague, Professor Adam Tompkins, who's the chair of constitutional law at Glasgow, who very publicly said, you come for Michael, you come for me. Um, and that's the kind of solidarity and support that Kathleen Stock did not get. And I think it, there's, there's a real consequence. I'm still in academia and she's not. Now, Michael, you said that your views have changed on feminism in the last decade. Let me ask you something. Did you ever consider feminists like me to be man-haters? Yes. Um, and I think part of that is from the political defense of man-hating that you get from within certain groups of feminist scholarship. Um, I'm thinking particularly, you know, Valerie Solanus is the Society for Cutting Up Men, the Scum Manifesto, things like that. You know, and, and at the time when I was a petulantly awful teenager, you know, imagine... Imagine me, but as a law student who thinks he's right. Um, nightmare, absolute nightmare. Um, so I'm looking at that stuff and I'm thinking, this isn't a movement for equality here. This is this is something that's um, driven by some kind of hatred. Or revenge. Um, revenge. Well, so this is the thing that I think I've moved on. Um, hatred can be, uh, well, hatred maybe is the wrong word, but anger can be very insightful. It can be a source of knowledge. Um, you can you can dismiss anger too much within particularly scholarship or academia or kind of highbrow society that if someone is angry, they're not thinking clearly. And in fact, I think in, in a lot of contexts, if you're not angry, you're not thinking very clearly. There's a lot of contexts where anger is the only appropriate response that you can have to certain forms of injustice. And so thinking about that, learning that as a way of kind of thinking about this has really kind of reframed some of the the way that I've thought about that. And I think the way I think about it now is, um, and I always thought it was completely understandable for women who've been the victims of male violence to hate the men who've been violent towards them. And then I always thought that extrapolating that to men as a group was illegitimate or unfair. But and so, and maybe the hatred, maybe extrapolating the hatred is unfair, but the anger is not, I don't think. I think extrapolating anger at the failure of men to act um, to prevent these kinds of harms is apt. Um, but I think there is a danger in there because it, it, anger can be very enticing as well. It can be addictive. It, it can make you feel righteous. It can, it can lead to people having inapt anger, anger that's disproportionate to the, the, the scale of what 
is being addressed. So the kind of anger that you might have over whether air conditioning is sexist, um, that is probably a little bit too much anger for the scale of the issue um, when you're not also equally being vocally angry about women who are being abused and beaten and raped and, and destroyed. But have you enjoyed meeting feminists and making new feminist friends oh it's been great i've loved it we are the uh, best aren't we oh absolutely yes and you were very very good at making fun of me which i which i very much appreciate as well